And thirdly, um, as someone was just saying to me, they find it critical realism really useful, but hard work at first, because the pure philosophy realism books are written in rather an abstract way. And many of us, like me, find it hard to understand something unless we have a practical example. So when I work through the slides, what I hope we'll all do is come up with practical examples that illuminate it for you to share with all of us. Um, there's only about 25 slides, so if we sort of go along slowly and you bring in examples, that would be nice. And as it's a two-hour session, maybe we'll have, a, a, say, a ten-minute break halfway through. If we get through the slides quite quickly, then I'll ask you to get into groups and talk a bit more about how you would use some of the ideas, and then we'll share that out. Um, did you want to put any more spare chairs by the door before we begin, Rachel, so that all the can Do you want to pass it to me? Mm -hmm. The other piece of business is that there is a sign-in list going around. If you could just initial by your name or check your name, or if you're not on there, add your name to the list. That would be great. Now, I expect there's a big range of people who know quite a lot and people who are beginners. I hope I don't go too fast or too slow, so certainly stop me if you'd like things to be clearer. Right. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, the people who wrote the original books took about 10 to 20 years writing them and working them out. And Roy Basker, the main founder, I expect you all know he runs free fortnightly seminars here that anyone can go to. And I hope as you get more, the beginning people get more interested in it, they feel like going to the seminars. Um, so I'm going to cover this evening topics that he covers over weeks in much greater depth. This is just an introduction. Um, so, um, also if you want more background, there's um, the first three chapters of my book on critical realism going to detail about this session. <laughs> so first of all, to make it really clear, because some sociologists get really cross with philosophers and think that they're, they're coming in and they're going to tell us what to do, and if we start doing philosophy, everything's going to get terribly boring and <laughs> erudite and far too micro-detailed. Um, and critical realism is meant to be exactly the opposite. Not the master builder, but the under-laborer who clears away the rubbish and provides the tools for people to use in any way they want to. And that's partly why the critical realism books are so abstract. I think it's that they don't want to venture into social science. They want to leave that to the social scientists. So it is a toolkit for researchers. It's not a form of sociology. And the aims of critical realism are to raise and clarify uncertainties. And quite a lot of things we take for granted and maybe don't think is a problem until we start thinking about it. Resolve contradictions, confusions, disagreements. Connect opposing theories, and I'm going to outline two very opposing ones, and then show how critical realism can bring them together. And that will increase the strength and validity of our work and its power and re relevance, because I think a lot of people um, feel very impatient with social scientists, and particularly sociologists, saying, oh, they can't agree among themselves, so who's going to believe them? And one lot going for facts and statistics, and the other lot going for, do we really know anything's happening, and how do we know? And the two don't seem to meet at all. And critical realism is a way of resolving these differences. Now, 
I'm using childhood as the example through this, but you could apply it to any topic. And for childhood studies research, the new childhood studies, by the way, could you put your hands up if you sort of know about or are involved in childhood studies? Quite a lot of people. And um, anyone here from child psychology and development? Or? No. Um, it just says, I expect you know there is quite a difference from the longer tradition of child development and the new eye, international childhood studies. But, <clears throat> Do, we don't really all agree with each other about what childhood means and how we should study it. And we're getting more and more perhaps fragmented into subspecialties. You know, there are the geographers and the historians and the social care people and so on. Can we bring them all together to have a, a rich and more coherent idea of childhood? Um, 20 years ago, when things began, I think a lot of us were really concerned that children, as women used to be, were so excluded from the mainstream literature. And would you agree that um, until the 70s or 80s it was men? Um, but even today, open any book on politics, law, climate change, housing, look at the index, children, young people, not usually there, not usually thought of. It tends to be adults as economic agents that everyone is thinking about. And yet, of course, across the world, a third of people are aged under 19, perhaps under 15, because so many births are not registered. We don't, you know, there really are estimates of the population. But we can't have a, a clear idea of the world's needs and the different societies if we ignore a third of the people. As women used to argue, how can you understand society? Women, lots of feminists say, if you forget half the people, but when they say that, they're missing out children and young people who are one third. And so really, childhood studies did hope to get the childhood more into the mainstream. And you would hope also more of the mainstream will get into childhood studies, into how does housing or benefits or new policies affect children. Um, and really, so much of it is still on the personal side of children's lives, play, home, school, protection, child health. And would you agree that we don't really have enough about neoliberalism and global policies and how they are affecting children? <clears throat> Now, critical realism offers ways to connect theories and methods and these great wide range of topics, and also ways to validate and ground our conclusions. So when people say, you know, prove it, or how relevant is your work, or how do you justify and validate your work, there are useful ideas here. And therefore, we can move on from our evidence towards our conclusions and our recommendations for policy and practice with more confidence, I would suggest. There's the whole debate about whether we should be value free or whether we should work for emancipation and children's rights and greater freedoms and respect for them. That's another debate in critical realism. And then there's the debate about empiricism, facts versus interpretivism. And so often, these two don't just contradict each other, they are defined in a way, in relation to each other. So, um, just to start with empirical or positivist social and natural science, and it's based on this idea of the remote researcher who doesn't interact with the research subject and tends to abstract them from their context, isolate them and study them as separate variables. Um, one example, in a way, is the birth cohorts. We've, we've got millions of data, but we don't know about the individual children and how these all connect in a line. They're supposed to be presented as objective, self-evident, <coughs> value-free facts. They just speak for themselves. They're such a huge mass of data that they stand up alone. And rather set apart from their social context, except in covariate analysis. Um, so all these facts and data are all seen as, in a way, independent, pristine, 
the same for whoever observes, reports, or reads about them. The, the number of mothers who um, go out to work for part time and so on is just seen as a fact. Well, actually, it's awfully complicated in reality. Um, the factors seen like a child, a household, a neighbourhood are seen as having essential, inherent qualities that are stable, lasting reality out there in the world, unchanging time and space, so that I could talk equally in Australia or Hong Kong about the data in the cohort studies and everybody might receive them in the same way and they would be intact. And um, on the whole, there isn't that much attention to differences of words and meanings so that images, neuroscans, statistics are taken almost as objective data. Um, would anybody like to disagree with this, by the way, or comment on this summary? Right, so my two others are that, oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I, just thinking in my head, wasn't yeah. there a lot of, in the 70s, particularly in relation to women, a lot of discussion with people like Alison McFarlane saying, well actually, statistics are constructions to some extent, sort of people who were dealing with these kind of things making the same kind of comments that you're making. Some of them were, but she belongs to the radical statistics group, mm -hmm. doesn't she? She's mm -hmm. not very typical of statisticians, really, Alison oh, okay. McFarlane, yeah. is she? And so anyway, she makes the point that she's criticised. She's criticising her discipline, mm -hmm. but on the whole, being like this, would mm -hmm. you say? Mm -hmm. And on the whole, um, both the statisticians and economists who present the data, and the politicians who quote and cite it, tend to take this attitude to research data. Um, and so, the last two attitudes are that um, they can be used to prove general laws, replicable findings, reliable predictions, and that evidence-based findings yield self-evident conclusions. You know, certain uh, children behave badly, linked up to certain likely antecedents, and so therefore we should tackle single-parent families, something like this. Um, and that supports effective policy making and problem solving. And so examples of all this kind of work, which is very much favoured by the government and the research councils and very much funded by them and used by them, include lab experiments, psychology tests, school exams, more and more we, school exams are taken as a measure of the school and the nation in the global race the birth cohort surveys of children's learning and behaviour, mental health, crime, and surveys of parents and teachers' views about children, although increasingly children are now also interviewed for their own views. Okay, so that's the empirical positivist approach to research, which not everybody agrees with completely wholeheartedly, but that tends to be the general practice in many large funded research projects here. Would you agree? I saw that. I think um, our um, institution did it draw in 78 million or 278 million. Something astronomical, the director's report last week. Did anyone read it? <coughs> right. Well, <laughs> it's all in your email boxes, the staff waiting there. A stupendous amount of money was raised for research, largely of this description. Now, in contrast, and the social um, sociology of child particularly emphasised this about 20, 25 years ago is the hermeneutic. Hermeneutic meaning this kind of double interaction so that the adult might be saying, oh, you little child, I'll help you. Or, oh, you're a victim, I'll rescue you. Or, oh, you're a strong, resilient, resourceful, contributing child, I'll be more, have a more equal relationship with you. And as Researchers pointed out to Anne Solberg, a Norwegian researcher, um, Toria said, you're treating us like little children. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <coughs> the 10-year-old um, Amy, who had achondroplasia, she was very short, um, I was doing research about children's consent to surgery, and she, um, I said, oh, you're having your legs moved on, and she said, 
I'm having, I suffer from achondroplasia and I'm having my femur lengthen. And she transformed the patronizing adult child into not just really an equal relationship, but she was the expert who informed me. Um, and so very much if we set up this dyad that tends to enforce and reinforce itself as we go on, um, it affects our research very much. And social re science researchers are saying, you know, be careful what dyad you're setting up. It can be uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, and don't mistake it for reality. Um, now, again, four-year-olds in nurseries, um, I was watching them yesterday, and you know, when somebody falls over, oh, darling, are you all right? <laughs> and and um, uh, Antonella Invanessi, have any of you read her work in Peru with uh, street traders? <coughs> and um, really young boys, aged four, five, and six, were agreeing with their mothers that they would learn more and earn more if they set up their own, not store, but uh, they just sat on their own with their books and they knew how to manage this, and they were treated in a way, in adult ways. So that the way we expect and behave and encourage children to behave enormously affects what their capacities are and seem to be. This is moving hugely away from the fact-based approach. Um, the difficulty, of course, is then in getting into relativism. Is there any reality? Is there any real child there? Are there any real standards or ways that we ought to behave for children, ought to protect them and expect from them? Um, if um, we think, as some anthropologists do, for example, that in each place, the morality and the meaning-making make sense in that place, in that context, and they wouldn't elsewhere, then things can get, it can be very difficult to compare different um, areas and to have a general morality and general idea of rights. <clears throat> Is there any way around this problem of relativism and of transferring meaning? <clears throat> and yet, of course, on, on the other hand, anthropologists and others come back from these places uh, write their um, journal papers and their emails and expect them to be transferable to a large extent and to make sense to us. So in a way there's a split between the theories, everything is contingent and local, and the practice, oh well I can transfer ideas and meaning across the world. More questions about um, research are whether it's um, functional, is everything is organised in society to function as well as possible for the good of the majority. And if people are not behaving well, well, we need to socialise children more or punish or exclude people or reform them and get them to um, conform again into this society. Or else the contrasting one of critical theory where everyone is competing for scarce resources, power, control, um, there's a huge intergenerational differences going on at the moment, say in this country, of the way the cuts are particularly hurting younger people and protecting older people. And um, uh, where their conflict um, and can sometimes be a benign and positive reaction towards improving society and changing it. Um, yeah. Oh, I think I've missed out. Um, yeah, I've missed out two things, which is how actually um, um, interpretive research is defined in opposition to positivist empirical research. And um, I'll just go through this to show you differences, because um, in interpretive research, there aren't such things as facts. Uh, we are creating and constructing, shifting things. Um, we can't set uh, anything away from its social context and really understand it. Um, facts or the data that we collect are not independent, standalone, like the little thing under the microscope. Um, pristine, whoever looks at that thing will see the same. Take any child 
and each of us will probably have a different picture, story, and idea in our minds. So, um, are there any essential, inherent qualities <coughs> in any of us? Is there a stable, lasting reality out there in the world, climate change across time and space, or are all of these things our own interpretations, constructions, not only the person who creates, say, a neuroscan, but the person who reads it. And, of course, there's quite a lot of criticism of neuroscans, saying they're blobograms, and uh, they don't really mean much at all. They simply lack something lighting up. What does it tell you that you didn't know anyway? There's all that debate going on. <coughs> um, so, um, can social science, evidence, data, prove any general laws at all? And if some, one person does a survey or some action research and somebody else comes in, can they replicate it exactly? Well, no. But does that mean that no findings at all are transferable or relevant or useful in other settings? And um, what can we do about causes and effects? Effective policy making and problem solving, if everything is so contingent, shifting, and individually understood, interpreted, and acted on. And the point of critical realism partly is to draw these two opposing ideas together. So, um, the aims of my book are to introduce critical realism, and it only is the first rung of the ladder. And um, I've been going to Roy's fortnightly seminars for five years now, and every time I go, I learn something more. It's a, a matter of just going on and on, learning it more, like learning the language in a way. And um, we're all we're all always learning our language, aren't we? New words, new meanings, new ideas. Um, now, critical realism in the book, I want to look at gaps and absences, as well as achievements and contradictions in childhood studies, and look at how they can address and resolve them. I want to get more people aware of childhood studies, because lots of people just don't know about, about it, and uh, think that um, child development, psychology, is, is childhood studies, and that's all we need to know. And I also want to look at how childhood studies can contribute a great deal to critical realism and connect childhood more into the adult world of research and policy, just as feminism did for women. So looking at how economics, politics, justice, war, trade, states, markets, climate change, all particularly affect children. That mainly the second volume of the book, I'm still writing. <coughs> and. Um, there aren't that many um, ways that look at um, children in really adult ways, uh, particularly with critical realism. And Phil Mizzen, his work in Accra in Ghana, is a marvellous exception. Um, also, I expect you know about the Oxford Young Lives studies, do you? They're not using critical realism, but what they are doing is using um, uh, working in four different continents a huge amount of 15 years of longitudinal research and detailed ethnographic studies and interviews and combining all kinds of different data and research methods and research disciplines together to understand childhood. And also I want to draw together the macro and micro. So that I've got um, four main chapters in each of my books and the first is on bodies and the other will be on nature and ecology. Um, one will be on um, interpersonal relationships and looking particularly at economics as that. Then structures around childhood and then um, ethics and personal flourishing. I'm going to go through this in a bit more detail. Um, <coughs> <coughs> now, the first thing, um, critical realism, the critical really refers to Marx and a great deal of this draws on Marx's work. And Marx said, do you know where he said history begins? Does anyone know where Marx said history begins? With bodies and searching for food. <laughs> um, 
um, and the Australian book about Marx and ecology, and his PhD was about ecology. He was very worried about the way the world was changing and the way everyone was going to be dragged into cities and how bad it was for their bodies and their health. Um, and so he's very material, very physical, very real about human life. And so Roy began by saying that everyone thinks that we can't just naively and simply adopt natural science methods, positive ones, for social science <coughs> because they're just too simple and basic. Um, but what he says is this assumes that there's a huge difference between natural and social science and that the natural scientists deal with things and social scientists deal with ideas that are floating around. <coughs> he said, well, natural scientists deal with ideas, eureka, gravity, um, evolution. You can't actually hold gravity or evolution and look at it. They are theories. They're imaginative ideas that are plausible, lasting explanations, but they're still theories. And we cannot ever see them except in their um, effects. So we see lots of falling stones, and, but we don't see the gravity that drag, actually drags them down. And I said, well, in that way, it's like social science. We observe lots of things, Underneath are the deep causal um, powers that bring about these effects. Now, if we collect lots of data, like in the birth cohorts of people's lives, housing, education, health, and try to trace patterns between them, like covariables, that's a bit like looking at lots of falling stones and saying, Ooh, that's interesting. Are there patterns in the falling? Are the stones affecting one another? Was Aristotle right to think that fall, stones fall because of their weight, their gravitas? Um, and is the power and the cause inside the objects and their relationships? And of course, Newton said, well, oh, no, <laughs> it's not that at all. To, to explain what's going on, you have to look at the invisible hidden cause of gravity. Similarly, Roy said, well, for social science, when we look at inequality, poverty, crime, failure in schools, it's not enough just to look at the visible evidence of the style of teaching, um, the observed behavior of people and what they say. We need to look at the deeper causes of class, gender, racism, and so on. <coughs> And they have as much um, strength and validity as uh, scientific explanations of evolution or gravity. And this idea of retroduction is that kind of eureka leap of imagination of connecting the visible to some deep cause. <coughs> and then uh, working really hard to demonstrate the links. <coughs> so, Naturalism is a um, scientific research method, and the possibility of naturalism is to transfer it to social science and to say how much more similar social and natural sciences are. They're not identical, but there is a, a unity to them. Um, I, I'm not sure if I say it later on, but. Um, That's right, I'll leave, it. I'll leave that. Um, um, now to go for this idea of hermeneutics and interpretivism, and when we see a child, what we see is our idea. <coughs> um, when we see this 12-year-old um, girl, we might see an orphan, um, a very deprived, disadvantaged <coughs> girl. Or we might see a very strong, resilient householder who is looking after her two sisters. Uh, a, a recent study in South Africa of thousands of homeless uh, children and young people found that most of them would much rather stay and live with their siblings than to be moved into adult-run households. So,
shifting transitive perceptions, not just our imposition of our ideas, but how people make meaning of themselves, are vital in understanding um, existing entities. And they do partly reshape them. It's not a matter of the idea is there and the thing and the reality is there. The idea shapes how people behave, react, respond. But maybe social scientists have become too, um, too much seeking refuge in idea and social constructions and are worried about facts and independent, fixed, in transitive reality. I think some uh, childhood researchers think that if you peel away the layers of the onion of all the behaves, beliefs, behaves and that, you won't get 20 child in, in the end. They'll just be... And also some researchers with the body suggest that we don't really have bodies. All we have are how we perceive and enact bodies, bodies without organs and so on. Um, would you like to give any other examples of quite extreme social constructions that have come across? I know most people here are quite practical and policy oriented and probably don't spend a lot of time reading deeper theory. I think, yeah, I think in one session um, last term we were talking about how puberty could be a social construction. Very interesting. Puberty, yes. Because um, a lot of people are really unhappy about it, how it's imposed on young people and used either to excuse or explain or, or accuse them of their behaviours and dismiss, dismiss it. So puberty it is very much a social construction in terms of it's an industry and um, there are loads of experts uh, with a lot of power and income from... And it has a, it's, a, it's an idea that has gripped the whole world and is used very much so, isn't it? But has it got any reality at all, do you think? And if so, what would that be? Reproduction. What, people become capable of reproduction? Yeah, actually, puberty's been stretched from eight years up to 25, hasn't it? So, <laughs> so it, it seems to be a social status that's been ascribed to a whole lot of people. You could say um, it's a genetic, um, sexual time of life changing of the body, and that is a reality. But it doesn't usually stretch over about 13 years or more. It, so there is definitely, wouldn't you say, biochemical and physiological changes in the body that could be called puberty. But then to transfer it onto a whole lot of behaviours, relationships, status, is a very complicated thing, and it's important to make the difference. Would you agree, Peter, or what are you thinking? Yeah, no, I was just thinking about the similar, you know, adolescence. Mm. This, you know, is, is another one. What is adolescence? Yes, it was invented in 1904, wasn't it? With this great tone that goes on and on and on about bodies and menstruation. But it, came, but it kind of came into public consciousness in the 1950s, really, which has interesting economic yeah, yeah. yeah. And also in the early 20th century, in America, there were so many immigrants, they were really worried about only 10 years of education, and they felt 20 years was going to meld the whole nation into a more unified whole if they had more schooling and more college. And that was a great um, reason to put um, a longer distance between childhood and adulthood. And so there were political and economic reasons for this, but that doesn't turn it back into a biological, a whole ba wholly biological fact. <coughs> just to clarify, um, so take your example of adolescence, then the intransigent transient reality is the fact that there is a sudden speeding up in physiological change at a certain point, um, and the transient reality is the notion of adolescence as some kind of mystical thing that does terrible things to people and accounts for all sorts of behaviours. Yes. Right. Yeah. Would you all agree with that? Mm. that there is a, a, a reality there, a factual, physiological, and also it's it's in a way it's to some degree universal around the world. It's just so it is a genetic human trait. Mm. Mm. But, but, but only, only 
some people would say it goes from eight to 23. I think most of us would sort of say, oh, you know, my daughter, my son, it's kind of 11 to 14, and then or whatever, it's different for different children. But you're kind of citing some quite extreme examples, but I think they're the minority. Well, then, when they say my, my daughter, my son, 11 to 14, is, is going to a pupil, they then say, and that explains why <laughs> they're do. all moody. <laughs> Some and people do. Also, there's this whole thing about hormonal adolescence and volatile. Goodness. Um, that's that's quite an age. ignorant um, construction of it, though. Uh, yeah, so that's because quite a, uh, it's very age-based, though, isn't it? I mean, do you often hear 40-year-olds described as who behave in the same way? No, we don't. Or nowadays, seven and eight-year-olds, oh, they're pre-pupils. Yeah. <laughs> it's used as, on the whole, a term of rather denigration. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, and then it's used in public policy, like child and adolescent mental health services mm. are 13 to sometimes 18 or 25. So that is quite a long stretch where you're in CAMS, in that category of mm, adolescence. Yeah, which is a big problem from the law, because the law changes when they're 18, and that tends not to recognise it. Yeah. And, and also, that, you know, the notion of competence. When is a child competent? <coughs> what is a competent child? Yes. Mm. Mm. And how much is a competence actually in their thinking and skillful doing, or in our expectations? or in the amount of practice they have, or in the scaffolding in which adults help them to become more com competent very quickly sometimes. What actually, is it fixed, or is it a capacity that's very uh, transitional and changeable? And how all of us can be very competent in some settings and very de-skilled, nervous, and being terrible in others. And that's how really the, the transitive people's attitudes and behaviours really affects our deep behaviours and can shape it. So that there is this interaction between them, a big overlap between them, but at some point there is the intransitive idea and the, the transitive idea and the intransitive physical change or actual inability to speak French or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, now, also, if we think there's um, an intransigent, intransigent reality, we can respect people with their own lives and histories being there before we look at them and being there after. Whereas in some childhood research, there is rather a, an implication that, oh, when they arrive at school, we all behave in this particular way, and my research has shown you the picture of the child and um, it can be quite a superficial picture because we don't know what happens to them before and after school and so on. Um, and also it, it in, encourages us to stand back and not impose our perceptions on this school child too much, thinking Actually, they're an independent person in many ways with other lives that we don't know about. So, intransitive realities and transitive perceptions certainly interact, but also there is at some point where they can be separated. Would anybody like to give an example where they think they can't be? Is, would you like to give examples of where you think people um, don't recognise the difference enough? They reduce one into the other too much. I think maybe labels like autism, people think they know what they mean by autism, but actually it covers a much wider range than Very good example. And that shapes the way they behave to the person and sets up the hermeneutic of, oh, you're autistic, I'm sane and normal, and mm. yes, and, and also maybe protests and denial from the autistic person will be used to increase the idea they're autistic. Instead, it's, so they're in a catch-22, really, and mm. the 
they protest, they just seem to ever deeper into the role in other people's views. And a lot of childhood studies is about trying to rethink that and, and rescue people from that. But then you can get to the other extreme where autism does not exist at all. And then you have the terribly hard research work of thinking, well, what is it? Um, what sort of net its nature, its function, and how it, are its uh, cause and effects known? Yes. <clears throat> now, um, another thing is, it seems terribly basic and simple, but there's epistemology and ontology, and people use the words all the time, and they mystify epistemology, saying, I'm just thinking about thinking about thinking or something. <laughs> <laughs> if we call it epistemology thinking, an ontology being and living and doing, the two are really different. And the epistemic fallacy is when the being and doing is collapsed into the thinking. And Roy argues that researchers do this all the time. And so um, things are collapsed into thought. So real children are collapsed into abstract ideas about childhood, or like, such as developmental stages, or images of victim children, statistics, social constructions. Um, would you like to give me any examples of epistemic policies? Any, anything you think of that's a thing in research has been collapsed into a thought? is the way to separate the two. And the epistemic policy, it points out that we're always um, collapsing the doing into the thinking. Um, I'll give you an example, don't um, bother. Um, um, I'm not sure if it's on these slides, but <clears throat> the way that positivism um, collapses, you'd think that positivism, interestingly fact, will be very interested in ontology and real being and doing. However, when you look at the research, the data is usually statistics or um, groupings, interpretations, theories, policy proposals, uh, generalizations. And in, where, in a way, the individual children who were the givers of the data get lost in the positive researchers organized presented data would you agree do you think mm -hmm. <coughs> now with interpretive research again you'd think that we would be really interested in observing the um, being and doing of children but we're very interested in how this is socially constructed interpreted understood hermeneutically and we react and then children um, react in a certain way to us. So the whole thing actually gets um, your real child, whoever that is, gets sort of collapsed into our ideas about how people behave and interact. Well, would you like to give me any examples where you think people have really concentrated on ontology? in research. I'm going to give it a go, but yeah. can you just tell me if this is totally wrong? Yeah. I'm in my second year of my PhD now, um, but I've got a background in teaching. Um, You've got? I've got a background in primary school teaching, and my supervisor said to me, you need to stop thinking like a teacher, um, because that's kind of affecting your focus for your study. So my my being, or my kind of living as a, as a teacher, and what I know, is affecting my kind of knowledge about, my kind of focus on my study. Is that kind of an example? Very or good, yeah. Is it? And also, um, the thing that childhood studies really has learned from anthropology is, is when you go to your strange island, you don't sort of walk in and try and interact, and you don't try and make sense of it. You 
like a classroom, you know, think, oh, they're doing that because they've got ADHD or something like that. You try to see what is going on, why are people doing that, what, what are they thinking and doing and being, what is the nature and function of a, being a child or being a parent in, the, in this example. And it's very, very hard to suspend. I mean, even where parent is a kind of an epistemology because it positions the person in a certain set of relationships mm -hmm. and history and all sorts of things. We can't suspend our epistemology. We wouldn't know anything about it. But we can try to hold back and really think about the being and doing of the children concerned. Um, I've got an example later on of um, somebody doing that. So. <clears throat> now another is the semiotic triangle and again this is a rather extreme example of theoretical social science but if you know about semiotics uh, the idea is that you have to signify which is the idea in your mind of a child I mean even to look at a person and say you are a child is an epistemological thing to do in a way because they, it puts them in a set of social relationships with you and all the rest of it. And it's hard, often hard to see past that label to whoever is there. Um, but there's the, so there's the con, our concept of the child, and then there's a signifier like you know girl, kid, infant, whatever we use. And some of them say, oh, there's nothing else. There's not a real child. Um, but critical realism says that the way we can ground our research, validate it, make it justifiable and real, is to look as far as we can at the referent, the child, their being and their doing. I know it sounds extreme, but an awful lot of research really is about the um, concepts and the way we describe and explain them and label them. So, <clears throat> it, um, Roy said critical realism is grounded in this original reality. Um, we were researching in 40 and 80 units. Um, this was year, you know, years ago, before I came across critical realism. And we could ground our reports in the real buildings, the time, the space, the noise, or quiet, the policies, the staff teams, the babies, the families. There were social interactions and emotions and suffering and morbidity and mortality. Babies really died. Um, babies really were very ill indeed with malfunctioning organs and so on. So um, there was this reality. and. Um, at the time, I think I should have been much more confident that there really was this reality and we could compare the four units. Because um, do some of you, aren't, when you're researching in different sites, feel, well, it's not really fair to compare them. We can't because they're each their own entity with their own standards and reasons for functioning as they do. Do you feel that, Eleanor, sometimes? Uh, yes, I'm mm. um, thinking about two countries. Um, is there a point of comparing the children's voices in this country and the children's voices in another country. Is there any point in doing that? I don't know, I'm not sure. That's a great example because again if children are really unheard and quite oppressed and exploited maybe, is that a reason for uh, listening to their voices or if everyone that you speak to in that country thinks children not relevant, they haven't got people <coughs> left listening to or we're too poor or disadvantaged to have time for all this. What's your answer? What is your answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose my answer would be uh, about justice and human rights. That those don't, they change, but they still remain whatever the situation. Yes, and then we've got to think about whether human rights have an ontology, an independent existence, which is yeah. going to be the topic next time. Well, so, <laughs> should we move on from this? But, um, I think. I was just not uh, strong enough against the doctors who, of course, have their very, very grounded research policy and practice um, to say, well, of the four units, one was very baby and family friendly, one was very unfriendly, and the other two were in the middle, and we could have compared them more, and morally, and um, we could have um, 
I think, done more to try to persuade the unfriendly ones to do to change. And at the time, it didn't seem the right thing to do. I mean, have any of you others come across some sort of unfair differences that felt it's not our job to do too much about it? We just dis observe and describe and give people evidence they can use. What do you think, Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think, I mean, I think that's part of the job of being a researcher. What? Is actually looking and, and making statements. Pointing out yeah. inequality and... Yes. Yes. Do you others agree? Do you think we should be standing <coughs> up for justice? I, I think it's very difficult because you can end up just describing. It's difficult to know when... I'm just thinking of the example of how much time children get in clinical settings in order to have interaction directly with health professionals. And what the evidence points out is the reason they don't is, is because parents have a very, a, a very strong urge to take up that time to understand all those sort of, you know, how, does the how do the machines work and, and so on. And so children are sidelined as much as anything by parents. So. I, I, I do, I mean, it seems very hard, to, it is hard to say, oh, well, you should have appointment times that are half an hour instead of, making those kinds of challenges yes. feels <coughs> very difficult. Yeah. Actually, I think you've also said why the semiotic triangle is so important in childhood, <laughs> because so often the referent, the child, is missing or overlooked. And the adults are talking about their procedures and practices, their knowledge, their plans, their ambitions. And um, childhood studies is much more about really thinking hard about this triangle and the perspective of the, of the child and their valid knowledge and being. <coughs> oh, the next thing is um, natural necessity. Um, and um, as I said, um, the falling stones. <laughs> um, David Hume, the philosopher, insisted that um, science should, um, no, so should only look at the evident, the visible, not waste time with theorizing and imagining, and to look at the stones and the patterns between them, which is a very limited kind of science. And so <clears throat> critical realism is about the three levels and first of all, there's the empirical sense level. And actually, when I look at you, it's not simply a matter of that you are the facts sitting there. In order to, to see you and make sense of you empirically, I have to interpret that, oh, you're sitting here because you've come for a lecture to discuss an idea. So there has to be a lot of... Um, imaginative and intuitive work in anything that we look at in order to know what it is. I mean, even if you look at a knife, to know it's a knife and what it means and how it's used brings in lots of ideas that Hume pretend didn't happen. We have to make sense of things as well as to sense them. Empirical meaning taken in through our five senses, but also, as critical realism points out, processing it through our thinking. Then there's the actual things that happen, the events, the people, the objects, the actual road accident, the actual broken limbs. <clears throat> so the difference between empirical and actual is that um, the empirical would be our witnessing and making sense of the road accident, or experiencing it, wondering about it, and also seeing and taking part in it. Um, however, and these are the levels of much observation on statistical research. And particularly in social science, we tend to ignore the real. And by real, that means causal and the natural necessity in things like gravity, like evolution. And they're all unseen, unprovable forces, only visible in their unpredictable random effects. But we can rely on ideas of gravity and evolution, because so far nobody's disproved them. Can, they, can natural necessity in physical science apply to social science? Well, causal, deep causal powers include 
people's motives and reasons for action. So um, if I decide to lift my arm, that was a real cause. <clears throat> um, now there are structures of class, race, generation, ethnicity, inequality. Generation has not that much been researched as one of the massive causes of global movements. Look at the protests around the world. So many of them are um, being organized by re very well-educated, young, unemployed people. It's a huge generational economic inequality. <coughs> um, now, the statistical analysis of separate variables like you know, housing and parenting follows this falling stone as humans. Instead of looking for deeper unseen causes, now, one reason we don't look for closed um, unseen causes is people will say, I'll just give you the example. Um, you hear it so much on the, on the debates about politics and ethics. Um, oh, poverty doesn't stop children failing. You always get bright children from the working classes who get into Oxford. Therefore, that disproves that poverty is a cause of educational failure. And this is a classic way of looking at the visible evidence and not the causes. How can we look at the causes in a reasonable, justifiable way? Well, we have to think about open and closed systems. So in natural science, like experiments or drug trials, there are very rarely 100% results. You try a cancer trial, never would 100 people get better on it and nobody get worse or stay the same. They wouldn't have tried, it's that obvious. So, so natural science doesn't have this 100% um, the argument about the bright child getting rocks that demand a 100% proof before you believe in a cause. So social science has even less clear results than natural science. It's complex and unpredictable and non-replicable <coughs> and therefore we can't generalise from it, can we? But, as I've said, RCTs, randomised controlled trials, don't have this hundred percent. Now, closed systems where one overwhelming force is working are very rare. So, even with gravity, for example, we see birds, planes fly upwards, leaves spiral about in the wind, but we don't think that disproves there's gravity going on. We know that it's an open system with more than one force working in it. Gravity is working against jet engines or bird flight, other powers, other causal powers. And in the natural and social science, there are almost always open systems, two or more complete, competing causal powers. Right. Um, and so, when there are more than one power, the powers are determining, they're hugely influential, but they're not determinists. They don't con absolutely control 100%. Just as one bird doesn't disprove gravity, one clever child getting into Oxford doesn't improve the power of social inequalities that drag down people like gravity, unless they have exceptional other systems working for them. Does that sort of make sense? Do you sort of agree with that? Because it's another step towards saying that social science and natural science are actually more similar than we often think. And we can be a bit stronger about our claims about class, inequality, and poverty. We don't have to come up with results that are even better than science does. And when you think about the CERN, um, Thing under the Swiss Alps, you know. It, they've spent years and years and years building this thing to try and construct a closed system so that only the velocity will work, nothing else will interfere with it. That shows how very rare in science this 100% thing is. Um, have you heard people saying, um, you know, oh, seven children get into Oxford, go. I mean, do you think that's a plausible response from social science, saying there are different competing, complicated, strong causal powers in our lives, but that doesn't disprove them? That's really helpful, because I think that's an argument I always 
I know I disagree with, but when people say those statements, but it's incredibly hard to find a, 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 a way to respond to it. Yeah. Because it's so easily, you know, you've, you've written off a whole, you know, the, the, the clever child that, that kind of succeeds, or the, um, uh, you know, that those, those singular examples are so often used to suddenly disprove a whole element of, of the world. And that, it, I find it quite difficult sometimes to be able to come up with with um, a response to that that's, uh, that's sound, I suppose, yeah. that's... It I makes you know. sound biased and it makes you sound political, mm. doesn't it? But that's opposing an unreal idea of natural science against an unreal idea of the weakness of social science. Why do you just say on average? I was going to say, isn't it partly a statistical point yeah. that, that, that evidence is not the plural of anecdote? Yeah. Yeah. You can say that, but a lot of political people don't, aren't really impressed, are they? <laughs> but no, so their yeah. their their point their points about complexity yeah. and points about you know generalising from from a, from a poor sample. Yeah, um, especially as um, people some people say science the point of it is prediction and replication, and since we can't really achieve either um, very clearly in um, social science, then it's dismissed as a non-science by many people. But then one answer is to to question how often natural science can predict and how much how much effort has gone into setting it up in artificially so that it only has one causal power working whereas in everyday life uh, there'll be lots of them um, and a common example is some um, people who say well the randomized controlled trial with the word emphasis on controlled gets certain results but in real life you're going to get different results because for instance, you don't have the staffing and the attention to getting people to um, <laughs> comply with the treatment. There are all sorts of things like that. That's not to say that they're weak or unimportant. It's to qualify them in the same way that we can qualify, accept qualifications of social science. Um, did you want to have a break? Sure. Yeah, you, if you want to do like a good... Would you like one? About 10 minutes? Yeah? <coughs>